It's thinking. There we go. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. Welcome, everyone, here in Woodstock and those online to Church of God Woodstock's and Truth on the Web Ministries weekly Sabbath sermon series. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here and a blessing from our Heavenly Father to have this opportunity to fellowship with you. So today's sermon, um, I will do my best to move through the material and make it clear. So it might be a little longer than one, some of my recent ones have been, but uh, it's a nice day out. So just kind of, yep, just kind of relax, but not too much. Listen up, let the spirit flow, flow through me and through you, and uh, we'll get there. So first, a little disclaimer. Um, as with these things, we always, I, I, so I more have an opportunity to rewarn myself when I get this to spread this warning to others. So certainly this applies to me. We have to remember here, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 3, a, a snippet of them. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know it. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. And Paul says similar in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So and actually one of Brian's uh, the opening hymn, the church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. That's it. It's not. So Christianity is not complicated. There will be no quiz at the pearly gates. We will not have to know these things. And a fair amount of today's sermon is not useful for direct application to how, my, how I live my daily life. I would put it more in the gnosis category. However, it does not mean that it does not have value or purpose for the edification of the saints. But some of the facts and figures and numbers and places and names and such that we're going to talk about today, like I said, there's not going to be a quiz at the pearly gates that you're going to have to know all these things. But I believe there's definite, it is in Scripture. This is all laid out in Scripture, and I think it's important. And so we're going to look at, um, as the title opening slide kind of talked out or, or made clear, um, we're going to cover a story through the Bible and with a main focus on the events that are unfolded in the book of Acts from chapter 8 to chapter 15. So that's going to be our main focus. So we will start off here in Mark. 1615, Messiah enjoined the disciples and us by through them. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And indeed they did, as we read here in Acts 17, verse 6b. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. And this is in Thessalonica, and this is when Paul and Barnabas and others were there in Thessalonica, and the Jews were concerned. It's because everywhere they go, this Christianity thing just busts out. And it was going to happen in Thessalonica too, and it did, certainly. So just a quick uh, set of maps here. So this is the, the general world that existed, the, the modern world. Of course, the rest of the world existed also. It's not like it was just this little square, and then other things grew in later. But as far as the, the main area that was initially considered the modern world, this is it. And so it started out in Acts chapters 1 through 7 with this small little area down here in the lower left in yellow Judea. So that's where the gospel first came and was preached and beginning to spread out. In Acts chapter 8 through 12, it kind of spread up the Mediterranean coast into much of Syria and all the way up into Antioch and such. Not that there weren't maybe little pockets otherwise, but this is the main concentration. And then the rest of the book, book of Acts, chapter 13 through verse 28, it spread throughout the whole modern civilized world. I mean, it took over. It, it took over. So that's amazing. And it was God worked with them. So it was God that was doing it, but he did it by the hands and by the hearts and by the mouths of obedient men and women that he used to carry his gospel message because they loved to tell the story. So there's a lot of ways that the, the events that are that are talked about and that are unfolded in these chapters could be looked at and sliced and diced and things can be extracted out of them. There's a lot of stuff. So some years ago, I ran across um, a way to sort of relate uh, different but related events and people and time periods 
called a relational diagram. And it actually was, so I have a little snippet here of one. I did not do this one. This is uh, from the Star Wars original trilogy. Actually, this is the whole one. It's three times as long as this. I actually kind of cut it off at the end of the first, so part four. But so you're just, I'm not going to get, this is not about Star Wars. I'm not giving a, so if you haven't seen it, that's all good. You don't have to worry about it. But just just a, a, a quick one so you can see on the left there are different people or robots, if as the case may be, um, or other beings. So, and then across the bottom is time. So at the beginning is on the left and the end of the movie is on the right. And so you can see as the lines approach each other, those people and such were together in the story. And then when they, they fall apart, they were not together. And then you can see other little events that are in the gray area, like Leah rescued or the duel where, where Obi-Wan Kenobi was killed by Darth Vader. I'm sorry if I gave that away to anybody. Um, the Death Star, things like that. So, and then, like I said, it goes on. So this is a way to kind of just graphically portray plot points and players and time and see in, in a simple way, even if you don't really know the plot, at least you can see some major points there if you're interested. Some major players, major events, and how things unfolded over time. So I want to take a similar approach to the book of Acts from chapter 8 through chapter 15. So it's not exactly like this, but I've developed what I would call a relational diagram. And so let me see if I can get this to work here. So you do a pointer. So is the pointer visible now? Yeah. So over here on the left, you can see there are places. So Jerusalem, Samaria, Caesarea, Damascus, Antioch in Syria, uh, Tarsus, and Antioch in Pisidia. Okay, so those are the, and then across the turret on the bottom here, we started Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and we go through Acts 15, verse 35. So that's the time. So we're going to talk about, and then the people that are in play are up here. So we have Peter and Barnabas and Paul, the scattered saints, the group of scattered saints, and then Philip. So, so those are some of the people. So we're going to look at these people or this group of people um, through this period of time of Acts 1 through Acts 15, 35 and how they interacted with these different places. Not that there weren't other places in here, but these are kind of the main points. So we're going to look at each one individually real quick. Um, these slides will be available for download uh, later, so I'm not going to read all the scriptures that are referenced on the screen necessarily, but uh, I'll go through here. So we'll start with Philip. His is pretty much the simplest one. So Philip, we hear, started off in Jerusalem, and Acts 8.5, we read that he went to Samaria. And then in Acts 8.26, we see that he met up with the Ethiopian eunuch. And then he's later seen in Acts 40 in Caesarea. So pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And that's kind of the end in this section of Acts that we read about Philip. He really isn't talked, not that he died, he didn't die there or anything, but that's the, the last that we hear about. We pick up later in like chapter 19 where he's vi visited. But So that's Philip. Next, let's take a look at the scattered saints. Similar thing. So in Acts chapter 1, or chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, as a result of the persecution that arose from the stoning of Stephen, and what Paul then was doing, and it seems that in Acts, at the end of Acts chapter 7, is the first time that Paul is mentioned in Scripture, and it just identifies him as a young man. So I think at that point in time, he wasn't really known, but I think that kind of energized him and gave him a focus and a vision to then go to the, the priests and get authority first, just in Jerusalem and Judea to persecute the church. And so the church was scattered and it was scattered to many places. And so we read in Acts uh, 8, 1 through 4. And again, I won't read these verses. We'll read some of these later on. But uh, and then again, in Acts 11, 19 through 21, how, how the, the saints were scattered pretty much all over the place in in the region that was initially proselytized here in this region that's in, in yellow. So next, let's take a look at Peter. So a little more complex. So remember, uh, when, the, when the saints were scattered, the apostles actually were not scattered at that time. They still remained in Jerusalem. So however that worked out, they were able to still remain in Jerusalem for the most part and, and in regions in Judea whereas most of the other saints were scattered out of there. So here we see Peter, essentially a lot of moving around. Um, Jerusalem, he goes to Samaria in Acts 8.25, back to Jerusalem in 9.32, then he's um, in Caesarea in 
And then down in Acts 11, 1 through 2, he's in, or um, he was in Joppa and then Caesarea. And then he en ends up back in Jerusalem. So here we can see these are his movements across time in these areas. And then we see later on that he potentially was in Antioch in Syria. Well, let's take a look at Barnabas. So Barnabas, I'll, we're, we're going to cover a first couple of things in Barnabas' um, line, and then we'll come back later when we get Paul, because they essentially are the same after they met up. But we read about Barnabas first in Acts 11, where he's in Jerusalem. And then in Acts 11, 25, he's in Antioch in Syria, and he's sent to Tarsus to find Paul. And so let's pick up Paul here and see Paul's journey is up to about that same point. So here we see Paul in Acts 9, 1 through 3, where he's in Jerusalem and on his way to Damascus, and he's converted. He talks about that in Galatians 1, 17. He goes to Damascus and out into the wilderness for a period of time. Acts 9, 26, he goes back to Damascus, then he's back to Jerusalem. So let's take a look at, and then after this point here, essentially when Paul and Barnabas met up, their lines coincide up until Acts 16, where they diverge, but we're not going that far on this line. So, so we can see if we overlay Paul and Barnabas's lines that after this point here, where Barnabas and Paul met up in Tarsus, that they were together the whole time. So we can see several other scriptures that kind of make that clear, right? Yes, they were they were very close. It was very sad what happened in the end of Acts 15. I mean, that just what. So this is a way, and like I said, if you're interested in this, um, I, I see this as a way to more easily kind of get a big picture of what happened. And then here, I have laid all the lines down, and then I've added some events in here as well. So here, for example, and then it may be a little hard to read from the screen there, and it's definitely hard to read here from here from this old man's eyes. Um, but if you get the slides, you can download them and see the different scripture events and such. So th this kind of is a relational diagram of what these people were doing over that period of time, where they were at, what was going on from Acts chapter 1 to Acts 15.35. And we're going to dig into more detail about that. But just to kind of get an idea of who's who and where's where and when's when, I think this, at least it helped me. If nothing else, just putting it together helped, helped me kind of get a grasp on it. So remember that, the, so I started this off with the idea that they, these men have turned the world upside down, that Jesus told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And, and uh, within a few years after this particular uh, relational diagram ends, it already was known these men have turned the world upside down wherever they go. This, this Christianity thing breaks out. So how did that happen? Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Let's take a look here. Keep therefore and do them. This is talking about the commandments. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this greatest, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgment so righteous as all this law? which I set before you this day. So this is Moses relating again to Israel right before they crossed the Jordan, um, the commandments and what had happened at the foot of Sinai and the things that they had received, and reiterating the fact that, look, if we'll do this, we'll be a city on a hill. We'll be like a nation unlike any nation that has ever or ever will exist. And all the world will look on us and see the glory of God through us. So from the very beginning, Israel adopted from this an idea that they were not evangelistic. They did not go out into the world to look for converts. Their idea was, we're a bright light. If somebody wants to be converted, they come to us. That was kind of the way. And, and that is, in somewhat, to a certain extent, the way God set it up. So they weren't entirely wrong in that, but they developed a conceit as a result of what God had given them, which could have happened to any of us, certainly so. But from the very beginning, their, their mentality, their thought was that we are the people of God, that we have the statutes and the oracles of God, and we have the tabernacle where God dwells amongst men on earth, 
And if someone wants to know God, they need to come to us. So that's the way God set it up. That was there. And they, they became very aloof in that idea. One of the main um, rites of passage to join them was, as we read here in Exodus 12, 48, and when a stranger or someone who was not a natural born Israelite shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. He and he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. And then we actually read here out of Brenton's uh, Septuagint translation into English from Greek into English out of Esther. We see that idea again, um, similar to what happened in Egypt when many of the Egyptians also, they saw the plagues and they put the, the blood on the doors and, and the death angel passed over their houses as well. So it was a mixed multitude that went out of Egypt. So in a similar fashion, what happened um, in Esther's time, uh, we read here, in every city and province where the ordinance was published, the ordinance to kill all the Jews. Um, wherever the proclamation took place, the Jews had joy and gladness, feasting and mirth because God had delivered them from the hands of the, the, the plots that Haman had devised to get them all killed. And so the people that weren't Jews saw how God had worked amongst the Jews, and God was glorified in their eyes. And as a result, they said, and many of the Gentiles, those who were not Jews, were circumcised and became Jews for fear of the Jews. So here's an example of that same idea that if you want to be a person of God, if you want to be part of the people of God, you come to the Jews and you do what the Jews do. In this case here, you'd be circumcised. And God was good with this. So this, again, God set this up in general in that time. That was proper. Now, what the, there were two main mistakes that the Jews made and, and many others as well was to think that they were exclusively the only people of God in the entire world. And if you just read scripture, you know that's not true. And then two, they thought that people had to come to them and join unto them and take onto them all the rules and laws and statutes and everything that God had given them as a nation to follow to be the people of God. And we can see this mentality um, carries right on into the New Testament era. We read here in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, for example, um, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and the strangers, Rome, Jews, and proselytes. So this is on Act, in Acts 2 when Peter's about to give a sermon. So these are all the people that have come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And so we read there's people, that, there are Jews from all over the place, and then there were also proselytes, people who had converted, people who had been circumcised for the males who had adopted the ways of the nation of Israel and the law of Moses and had joined themselves unto the nation of Israel with the, the hope to become one of the people of God. And then in Acts 6, 5, we see this another example. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Paramanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So a proselyte. So here we still see where people are, when they are not natural born Jews or Israelites, they are identified as proselytes or converts. So there's no, there is no one yet up to scripture really that's identified as one of the people of God that either isn't a natural born Israelite or a Jew or someone who has become a proselyte converted to the Torah, the ways of Moses. That's just the way it was. And again, God set that up to a certain extent back way back in Exodus 20, but it was taken too far and for the wrong reasons. So keep that in mind, the proselytes, there were no, right up to this point here, no one that was identified as a person of God or one of the, the people of God, or even as a Christian, although the term had not been adopted yet, um, was anybody other than a Jew or someone who had converted to Judaism i.e. circumcision and the other things. So let's take a step back from that, and we'll come back around and pick it up. So if you're playing hide-and-seek, for example, where might be places where people would never look to find you? So maybe like inside one of these electrical boxes. So don't go in there. That's dangerous. Don't go in there. So I would not, if I was playing hide-and-seek and looking for somebody, I would not look 
in there because I would not expect anybody to be foolish enough to go into one of those. Or how about this? That'd be horrifying there. That spider covered, you know, all this. So, uh, yeah. So, again, I would not expect somebody to actually climb up into that mess of webs and hide. And if they did, good. You win. <laughs> so. Or how about down inside here? Again. <laughs> yeah, but down inside there? I'm not going inside there. I don't mean inside the little port. I mean down inside the hole. They're hiding inside the tank. So this is not somewhere you would expect for someone to. These are all good hiding places. I would give it that. But they're not probably very wise or safe hiding places. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So taking a step back then from this idea, with this in mind, when Jesus says here in John 7, 34 through 35, or actually, he says here, you shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we can't find him? So was it one of those places? So what was his response? Or what was their thought? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? So that was like the last place that they would have ever expected he would go. So again, that just shows the mentality that they had. And I'm not picking on them. Yes, they were wrong in that mentality. But that shows the mentality that they were not evangelistic whatsoever. That wasn't even in their mindset. They didn't love to tell the story. They wanted people to come to them and hear the story as it was being told to many people. That's just the way, the way it unfolded. So they weren't going out into the world. But yet it's these same people that turned the world upside down. So what happened? What changed? And this is, this is and, and the verse that we were reading before in Acts, that's many years after, especially in Acts 6, many years after Pentecost, many years after the New Testament church had started. So what changed? What happened? So let's take a look here real quick. Make sure I got this in the right order. One other verse, and then we'll... In Acts 11, verses 1 through 3, we read, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, that they were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou went into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. So this is right after Peter in Acts chapter 10 went to Cornelius, who was not a proselyte. People try to say, well, Cornelius, because he was well thought of by the Jews, that he was circumcised, but Cornelius is never identified as a proselyte. He is a godly man who gave alms always, who prayed to God always, who the Jews thought well of because he was a godly man, but he was not a proselyte. He was not converted, i.e., he was not circumcised. Well, right, right, exactly. Yes. Well, someone at some Jeff's question was, how could they contend with Peter about, you know, if he was circumcised, why would they say, well, you went into men uncircumcised? But some some would contend that the words men uncircumcised here doesn't really mean physical circumcision. It just means they weren't natural born Israelites. There's no context whatsoever in Scripture for that anywhere that is completely reading into Scripture. So the question that I want to dwell on here and try to prove out is when did it become apparent to the apostles and elders that God had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles? When did it become apparent? Well, some would say that it happened here in Antioch and Syria. In Acts 11, verses 19 through 20, just a few verses after what we just read, we read here, now they which were scattered abroad about the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. And Phoenice actually is in the island of Crete, which is a, quite a far distance away. Cyprus is its own island. Antioch is um, up the coast there. Preaching the word to none but under the Jews only. So they were still just only preaching to the Jews. They were going to synagogues or other Jewish settlements. When they got scattered, they went to their brethren. And they preached the gospel. And many of the brethren believed. So that was good. Uh, but then the 
Next verse, verse 20 starts off, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they came to Antioch, so Cyprus and Cyrene, Cyprus is an island, and Cyrene is along the northern coast of Africa and Libya. These were Jews, which when they came to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So some say this word Grecians means Gentiles, Greeks, non-Israelites, non-proselytes. But let's take a look at that. So in, 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 the, in the New Testament, there are some, which was written in Greek. There is a word for Greek. So first we'll start off with Hellas. So Strong 1671 is Hellas, which is the actual country of Greece. So that's the, the geographical region known as Greece. Then there is the derivative of that Strong's 1672, which is Hellene. And that is a Grecian or inhabitant, uh, inhabitant of Hellas, by extension, a Greek-speaking person, especially non-Jew. So this is a Gentile or a Greek. This is a Greek person. This is not a Jew. This is a Greek person. And then there is another related word, Strong's 1675, which is Hellenistas. So this is a derivative of 1672, but this is a Hellen Hellenized or Greek-speaking Jew. Now, when we say Hellenized, Hellenized just means from the Greek word Hellas, which is Greek. So these were these were other cultures, not just Jews, but other cultures that were indoctrinated into the Greek culture. So they were brought into the Greek culture. They adopted Greek ways. They began to speak in Greek. So in this case here, these Hellenistas or Hellenistes, these were Jews who had absorbed the Greek culture. And they spoke Greek. They did Greek things. It doesn't mean they did pagan worship necessarily, although some of them probably did, like all, all people groups. But it does, it's not a, it, this is not a condemnation of a Jew. They just, Paul, although he would not be considered a Hellenistes, he, he spoke Greek. He, in many ways, adopted Roman and Greek ways. So it, that did, but certainly he was a servant of God and he did not worship anything pagan. So there's only three places where this word Hellenistes is used in Scripture, and it, it's in Acts 6, 1. And so we're going to just real quick look at um, these three verses in three different translations just to see. Um, oh, and then, oh, so Hellenism here, which I already, def this is, a, so this is um, from the Jewish Encyclopedia, but essentially a word used to express assimilation, especially by the Jews of Greek speech, manners, and culture from the 4th century B.C. through the 1st centuries. So during the time of Christ and during the 1st century. This is what Hellenism or being Hellenized is. So we're going to look at these three verses here um, in three different translations. Well, again, King James, New, New American Standard, and Young's Literal. And we'll see here that while King James translates it Grecians, um, the New American Standard translates it Hellenistic Jews because it's Hellenistes. So that makes sense. It's clear. And then in Young's Literal, it's translated as Hellenists. So to identify that these are, are Jewish people, who have adopted the Greek culture. They have been Hellenized. They're Hellenized Jews. It doesn't mean they're pagan Jews. They're just Jews who have adopted, right? They speak Greek and they, yes. Uh, and then the second verse where this word, Greek word is used is in 929. And we'll see essentially the same set of translations. King James uses Grecians. Um, New American Standard Bible uses Hellenistic Jews and Young's Literal uses Hellenists. And then one other place, and that's in Acts 11.20, the verse that we already read, the one that some people use to say this is where they first began to speak to Gentiles, non-Jewish people. Same Greek word, though. And we'll see here that while well, King James says Grecians again, now the New American Standard uses Greeks here, but that actually there's a footnote in the New American Standard that says most manuscripts say Hellenistes, which is a Jewish, a Hellenized Jew. So, and then Young's Literal again uses Hellenists. So I think that first and foremost to say that the Jews were spoke to in, or non-Jews or Gentiles were spoke to starting in Acts 11.20, scripture doesn't bear that out. Just because it uses the word Grecians, um, especially taking in consideration the fact that in verse 19, it says here that they were preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. 
Now, it's possible, since that's the end of the sentence, that as it begins to go on, they're putting up the contrast and saying, and then they quit going to just Jews and went to the Grecians. But we can see that the Greek behind this word Grecians here doesn't mean Gentiles. It means Jews who spoke Greek and may have adopted other elements of Greek culture. So I don't think that's it. Now, you might in your mind be thinking, well, you skipped the, the most obvious one, and I actually read a little bit of it in Acts 11. But what, so remember the question is, so when did it become apparent to the Jews that God had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles? So, well, maybe in Joppa, Acts 10 and 11. So, now I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on this because I actually believe, and I had um, several slides in here that I took out because it would have probably added a half an hour, and it would have been very detailed and probably very difficult for me to get across um, that, that kind of laid out more reasoning why. But um, in, the, in the timeline here, you'll see that I actually have in the lower left Acts 11, 19 through 21, which is the going to the Hellenists, chronologically happening before Acts 10 and 11. And I'll show at least a little snippet of why I think that's true. I think that it's very clear in Scripture that that is the case, that, that at, what we read about, what we just read about in Acts 11, the last half of chapter 11, actually chronologically happened before Peter going to Cornelius and then coming back to Jerusalem and explaining what happened. And I'll show you why. So, But let's just go back to a couple quick verses that again i say this is back in acts um, 11 17 and 18 so this is the tail end of peter re-explain explaining to the the elders in jerusalem what happened in joppa or what happened in caesarea with uh with cornelius so he says for as much then as god gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the lord jesus christ what was i that i could withstand god when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So obviously Peter at this point understood that the, the Gentiles can come in too. Now it was a big fight for him to even go there, and it was a big fight to go and explain to the others to the point that they would accept it by the Spirit, that yes, this is true. And, then, and, uh, and, and it's <coughs> kind of reiterated, and we'll get to Acts 15 a little later. But here, uh, James stands up and says, Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people to his name. So he's referring to what happened in Acts 10 and was explained in Acts 11. But again, I believe that that happened after the next verses. And why? one of the reasons that I believe that is that the book of Acts, let's just kind of take a look at the way it's laid out a little bit, starting in Acts 8, verse 3. So we see here, I've got chapter, verse, and I have, it follows the apostles, it follows Saul, or slash Paul, um, and then a summary of what's going on in those verses. So since there's different groups of people, it can't like talk about the same thing at the same time. It has to talk about, okay, this group of people did this, and this, this group of people did this, and this group of people did that, right. So, so we see here in Acts 3, 8, 3, for example, um, it is not following the apostles, it's talking about Paul. And then Paul begins the persecution of the, uh, of the church and he scatters, this, the scattering starts. Acts 4, 8, 4 through 8, 40, um, it, it follows the apostles and it does not follow Paul and what Paul is doing. Paul's doing stuff, but it doesn't talk about what he's doing. So, and then the summary of that is the gospel is heard in Samaria, mainly Philip, Peter, and John. And at the end of like Acts the last few chapters or verses of Acts 8 is Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, for example. So then we go to Acts 9, 1 through 9, 31. Now we're back to Paul again. So now Acts is talking about what Paul is doing. And there is some interaction. Uh, there are some mention of some of the apostles, but it's mainly Paul is the main character that is being followed in those verses. And, and he's the main storyline that is being explained in those verses. And then starting in Acts 9, 32 through all the way through Acts 11, 18, uh, it's, it falls back on the apostles. And Paul is not talked about. And in that section of Scripture is where um, Peter 
Her travels through Samaria, ending up in Antioch in Syria, and in Acts 10, of course, is where he visits Cornelius in Acts 11. So then, and we see here in Acts 11, 19 to Acts 11, 30, it flips again. And now it doesn't follow the apostles, it follows Paul. So it's back and forth. And so 11, 19 to 11, 30 is where we just read it about. And so that's why I believe it's not, so that's why that actually happened chronologically before the events that we read about in Acts 9, 32 through 11, 18. Maybe during some of it, because there's several years that unfold, like between Acts 9.32 and 11.18 are several years that unfold. There's a lot of stuff that happens in there. So there's overlap. So just because it appears in Scripture in verses later does not mean necessarily that it chronologically happened later. And so as I said, this isn't the only reason that I strongly believe that Acts, that, that Acts 11.19 through 30 happened before Acts 10 chronologically. Uh, there's many other reasons, and if somebody wants to talk about it later on, that's fine. But I strongly believe that's the case. And this is just one, just to show that it's possible. So then the book of Acts, after, in Acts 12, 1 through 25, um, it picks up, it kind of talks, so in, at the last verse of 1130, uh, it talks about Paul and Barnabas being sent to Judea to take aid because of the, the famine that's going on in Judea. So, and then the last verse of chapter 12, it talks about Paul and Barnabas delivered the aid, and then they returned back to Antioch in Syria. And in between there is where Peter, where James is arrested and slain by, by Herod, and then where Peter's arrested and rescued by the angel, and where Herod is killed um, because of his blasphemy. So there it kind of talks about both because it's at the same time. It's kind of chronologically, it's going on at the same time. So Paul and Barnabas appears, they were in the region of Judea around the time that the act where, where James was slain and Peter was slain. And that also kind of makes sense because that was during the days of unleavened bread. And Paul and Barnabas might have wanted to go back to Jerusalem during those days. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that every year, but I'm sure. And then, and then Luke, who authored Acts, from, chap from chapter 13, verse 1, all the way through the rest of the book of the Acts, essentially, Paul is the main person that the story follows. Whatever, wherever Paul is, the book of Acts is. Yes, are other, do other apostles show up at time from here to there? Yes, they're not excluded, but the storyline of Acts follows Paul from chapter 13, verse 1, essentially, all the way to the end of the book of Acts. So it really could be broken into the three sections with the last section starting in chapter 13 that could be the acts of paul the apostle really and not just the acts but nonetheless so that's one of the reasons why at least i want to show that it is possible that just because verses show up later in a story doesn't mean that chronologically they might have been able to happen earlier right they could have been concurrent or previous yes or a mixture of both so but in, in any case, in any case, and, and one other thing too, um, Acts eleven nineteen, and my contention is that eleven nineteen is kind of either concurrent or before um, Acts eleven nine thirty two is because Acts eleven nineteen starts off now they which were scattered, so it goes all the way back to the scattering which happened in eight three. It kind of connects them, and says, now they were, which were scattered, and it kind of starts explaining there. So it sort of connects them. Whereas Acts 12.1 starts off, and about that time, so it connects it chronologically to the verse before it to show that they, so there are definitely many, I think there's many reasons why it's pretty clear that, that Acts 10 and the first half of 11 happened chronologically after Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through the end of the chapter for whatever that's worth. So that being said, even if, so certainly, certainly as far as scripture goes, we can see in Acts 10 where Peter was sent to Cornelius that that was the first time and it was a big deal that someone who was not a Jew or a proselyte received the gospel that they knew of. So that certainly is true and, and, they, and everyone in Jerusalem accepted that, but it still doesn't seem to have been any kind of catalyst for them to go out into the world. It was kind of a one-off event. There's no other evidence of Peter or James or John or anybody going out then, let's go out to the Gentile world and tell them. No, it seems to be a one-off thing. 
So while they understood that, yes, the door has been opened to the Gentiles, they didn't really understand the whole thing. So the other possible place, and this is the one that I think that it actually happened, was the Antioch in Pisidia. So, and there are different Antiochs, and so this is slide 41. Let me go back to the map here real quick. Again, just show. So we see here, the pointer's still on? Yes. All right, so... Um, so we see down here, we can do this. Where'd my mouse go? Not lost it. Okay, I can't do this. I'll have to do it here. All right. So here is Antioch in Syria. So this is the place like in Acts chapter 11 where they were at. This is the Antioch that they were at. Um, and then this is the Antioch in Pisidia. So Antioch was a common name. There were probably at some point, at, at different points in history, as many as 20 cities named Antioch. Antioch of this, Antioch of that. So, so it could be very confusing. But there's two main Antiochs that are, well, right, yeah. So it's Antiochus, the Seleucids, and so yeah. We'll actually look at that a little in a little more detail towards the end of the sermon. But I just want to show that um, just so you kind of get the idea. So we're going to go back to Antioch and Syria. We're going to pick up in Acts 13:1. We're going to be in Antioch and Syria, and we're going to end up here in Antioch and Pisidia. So let me get back to my slide. All right, so picking up in Acts 13, verse 1, or actually, so Acts 13 is where that's at, but we got to get there. So I'm going to go through a few verses here in Acts 11 first. So then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch in Syria. So he brought him, so he went to Tarsus, and then he brought him to Antioch in Syria, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. So it's a whole year they're in Antioch. Um, and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch in Syria. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. And then the last verse there. Oh, I talked about these already, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. <coughs> and then we see at the end of Acts 12, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Okay, so Antioch, they were in Antioch in Syria. They went to Judea for some period of time, and then they've come back to Antioch in Syria. Picking up in Acts 13, verses 1 through 4. Now there were, were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work. Whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy by Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So now I'll just go through real quick here, pull the map back up. So they sailed to Cyprus, and then we say, they, and, and then Acts 13 gives us some details in verse 5 and 6, that they went to Salamis and Paphros, which were also in Cyprus. Um, and that's where Saul was first called Paul. And also verses 7 through 12 in Acts 13, they uh, dealt with that false prophet Bar-Jesus and Elimaeus, the sorcerer, that also was on Cyprus. And then in verse 13, they went to Perga and Pamphylia, which is here. This is Pamphylia as a region, and Perga is a city on the coast. So they sailed from Cyprus into Perga. So that's where we're up to verse 13 in Acts chapter 13. So now they're in Perga. And then we're going to go to verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. So that's why Antioch in Syria is always just called Antioch. That's like the main Antioch. So that's the same for us. Like if we're talking about Woodstock, we, we know amongst ourselves, we mean Woodstock, Illinois. 
But if we if we talk to someone else, we might have to clarify because they might think Woodstock, New York or Woodstock, Georgia or other Woodstock. So, right. We have to clarify that. So same thing. Antioch in, in Syria was the main Antioch as far as the Christian circles went. So that's why it's always just identified as Antioch. Um, here's Antioch in Pisidia, which was in Asia Minor and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue set, said unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. So verses 17 through 41 of this chapter is a great sermon. I highly recommend it, but we're going to skip through that. Um, and we'll skip down to verse 42. So he preaches a sermon all about the, the Jews, and it, it culminates essentially as Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one you were expecting. You guys crucified him, but he's the one. So picking up in verse 42, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that the words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broke up, so now so there's there were Gentiles, so these were not converted Jews. These were not proselytes. They were there, and the Gentiles said, hey, we want to hear some more. So when the Jews left, the, the Gentiles came up and said, hey, we want to hear some more. And said, so now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes, so now these are the people that were the important ones, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, they came in the whole city together to hear the word of God. So this is just like what began to happen. This is what happened everywhere they went. This is why when they went to Thessalonica, they're like, hey, these ones, they turned the whole world upside down. They're here now. Danger, danger, because they saw the way their way of life falling away. So there were Gentiles at this time that came to Paul, but Paul wasn't specifically yet going. He was still going to the synagogues, and he never stopped doing that. Whenever he traveled somewhere, he always went to the synagogue first. But here we see, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first be have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So now he's talking about going to Gentiles, not proselytes, not Israelites, going to the Gentiles. This is the first time other than the one single incident of Peter with Cornelius, which took visions and men showing up and much stuff to happen. This is the first time where the message is being directly sent to or taken to the Gentiles. For so hath the law command the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And we'll skip down. We'll read a few verses, 49 through 52 here. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city, not just Jews, but everybody. They stirred them up and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And Iconium was just a nearby city. So Iconium is one of the cities here is Iconium. It's this little group of cities right here. They went from Antioch and Pisidia to Iconium. So guess what happened when they went to Iconium? What Paul did? He went to the, he went to the synagogue. And it came to pass in Iconium, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. That's what he always did, and to speak. And, the, and that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks. So these are not religious proselytes. These are Gentiles believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So there's quite a bit of stuff that happens in the next 20 verses here. Um, he travels around in the little area there. He goes Iconium, Derby, Lystra. He goes back to Antioch. Um, we're going to pick it up in verse 26. So they've left that region, and now they're going back to Antioch in Syria. 
so Antioch. So now they've sailed back and then sailed to Antioch. So they did some more traveling in Turkey, Asia Minor at the time, and then they sailed back to Antioch from whence they had been recommended by the grace of God for the work they fulfilled. So in other words, where they started at. They went back from where they started. Um, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed or they told all that God had done with them and how he, God, had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. So I believe here is where Paul recounts, and this is where it first was made apparent to the group of Christians that were mostly all Jews or proselytes in Syria and Judea and the regions there, that the door had been opened. It's not just one little one-off of where Peter was sent to Cornelius, but this thing's busted wide open. We're going to Gentiles, not a Jew in sight. We're preaching the message. They're hearing it. They're responding. They're being filled with the Holy Ghost. They're on fire, and they're spreading the same message. That the, in Antioch and Pisidia is where that first happened. And, and the regions there about, Lystra, Derbe, Perga, in those regions, that's where it happened. There had been, like I said, Cornelius, but that was a one-off, essentially. For the most part, they only, they only preached to the Jews. The Jews didn't have the mentality to go out. But Paul, by the Spirit, understood God's commanded us to do this. We got to go to that. We got to go to the whole world. We have been commanded to do this. So, just in answering that question, I, I think the three main contenders for the answer to that question would be Joppa, um, or in Samaria slash Antioch in Syria, or Antioch in Pisidia and the regions thereabouts. And I believe that it is the last one. I think that's where it first, where it really first opened up where the, truly the Gentiles were welcomed in by those who, by the Jews, where it was made apparent and clear. God had always welcomed them. God is not a respecter of persons. He had always welcomed that. But the Jews didn't understand. Now they understood. It's not like we don't, there aren't things that we don't understand too. So, and I'm not bashing Jews. I'm not, but. So, once it has become apparent that this thing is not exclusive to the Jews anymore and that the Jews don't have some kind of copyright or exclusive rights to be in God's people, that the Jews that were alive at the time um, aren't the gateway for any other nation to become uh, a person of God, a child of God, once that became apparent to everyone, then the next natural question that happened is what? Okay, well, so what do we do with these Gentiles? We know what we had to do, circumcised eighth day, um, all the other stuff, you know, law of Moses, we keep that, we're diligent for the law, we're zealous of the law. Uh, the law is certainly not sin, as long as you don't use it to justify yourself, certainly is not sin. And the Jews, there appeared to be no injunction from God, or from Paul, certainly, or anyone else, that the Jews, well, you should just quit doing all the Moses stuff. But what they did learn here is that, okay, that's all good, but we're not justified by any of that. We're justified by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah that we were expecting. And that's true of everyone in the world. So the natural question was, all right, well, so these Gentiles come in. They didn't grow up doing this stuff. What do we do with them? And so right on the tail of, so they're in Antioch. At the end of chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, they're in Antioch in Syria. And they've been, they stay there quite a while. And by now, Gentiles are coming in too. And so we pick up in Acts 15, verses 1 through 2. And this question rears its ugly head. And it's easy to, to think these men might have been evil or hard-hearted, but not necessarily so. They were zealous for the law. So we read here, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. As far as they knew, that's like how it was. And so, okay, so now it's open to Gentiles. It used to be, in their mind, it used to be, okay, you had to be circumcised first, and then you can partake. Whereas now, what happened with Cornelius was obvious. What happened with Paul's journeyings was obvious that these men and women could receive the Spirit of God before they were circumcised. But their natural conclusion was, okay, so maybe the order of events has changed a little bit, but certainly you must still be circumcised. 
and keep the law of Moses. Otherwise, you, you can't be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them would go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees that believing say that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And I, I don't know that these men have e had evil intent in their hearts. They were zealous for this, and they thought that it was integral to being a servant of God, a man of God, a woman of God. So the natural fleshly conclusion apart from the Spirit would be, well, certainly then these other people who want to call themselves God's people would have to do these same things. But Paul and Barnabas says, no, 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 not so fast. So then they go back to Jerusalem, and this question obviously had not been solved in Jerusalem either because they didn't just flat out say, oh, no, we already decided on that, and here is the verdict. No, they had discussions, and so we'll pick up in verses 6 through 9. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto the men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. No difference. Picking up in verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt you God? Why tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, the new Christians, the Gentile Christians, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Now remember, the question and contention here is circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. Now, we know nobody here is talking about greasy grace. Just read Paul's letters. Read what Paul preached. Holiness, righteousness, some things, these were you in the time past, but you're not anymore. But we're talking about the specifics of circumcision and the law of Moses. That was what was on the table here. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. So they kind of had that discussion, and Peter made his, his comment. And then Paul and Barnabas stand up, and they declare the miracles and wonders that had wrought among, God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. So then Paul and Barnabas kind of explained what had been going on and their, during their what's considered Paul's first missionary journey um, from Acts 13 and 14. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen up. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So this is one of the things when I did this back in 2016, I spent quite a bit more emphasis on this part and I'm not going to do that this time. Um, I think we have, there's been several sermons on, on our YouTube channel that talk about the covenants that are very good. So I just want to make a couple points here. Uh, there are two extremes here. It's obvious by this discussion and by the conclusion of both Paul and Barnabas initially, Peter's confession, and then James's statement here, that all of the elders and saints that were in Jerusalem and in Antioch and thereabouts agreed that the Gentiles did not need to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised, period. At the same time, we know that God knows the hearts of men and women. And, and he, so this is not opening the door to greasy grace. What was going on in the beginning of Acts 15 here is there was dissension. There was trouble between the two groups. You had the Gentiles and you had the Jews. And the Jews thought the Gentiles had to do certain things to be right with God. And the Gentiles said, well, no, we don't think we need to do those things. We weren't told we need to do those. We don't read anywhere we need to do those. So there was contention that needed to be solved. Now, no one is telling the Jews, okay, you've got to forsake all of Moses. Nobody was saying that whatsoever. And nobody was telling the Gentiles, yeah, you've got to adopt all these ways either. So what is this about? This is about, so Gentiles, if you will do these things, then the Jews will have no real moral objection towards you. 
you will be able to sit in the same synagogue or the same church together and worship the same God without any dissension. And so that's what the list is. This doesn't, because the list doesn't mention don't murder. We know no way they're saying, well, Gentiles can go kill people. That's not even on the table. That's not even the context of what they're talking about. They're trying to, yeah, they're trying to solve the issue that there was an argument between the, the Jews who were zealous for the law and the Gentiles who were zealous for the Lord. And, and the Jews were also zealous for the Lord. They were believers. So how to solve this? So this was their statement. Abstain from these things, from pollution to idols, from fornication, things strangled and from blood. And why are they doing this? Why is it important? Because although this first happened in Antioch, this argument, this disagreement that happened, they knew that this was going to happen everywhere throughout the world, that wherever there were Jews and Gentiles together, this same argument was going to occur. This same difficulty was going to happen. And so as a result, they say, for Moses of old time hath in every city, he that preached them being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So we're telling you this so that when in every city this same argument comes up, because they're going to be reading Moses in the synagogue, and the Jews that are zealous for the law are going to be telling the Gentiles, you got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. We're doing this so that the same answer can be given there that is being given here. So that's what verse 21 there is talking about. So then he goes on here, Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them. I thought the spirit was moving the blinds there. So, and they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto, this is a, a letter that they write, send greeting unto the brethren which are, are of the Gentiles in Antioch, which is where they just came from, Antioch and Syria, which is the surrounding area, and Cilicia, which is just north, the region just north of Syria. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So we didn't tell them to go say that. They're not necessarily condemning the people who said that, but they're saying they were wrong. We didn't tell them to say that. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So here the apostles, they wrote it down in a letter, and then they're going to send this letter back with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch, where the argument first started. But they're also saying, now we're going to send other men along with them, just so you don't think, well, of course, Paul and Barnabas come back and they say that, oh, they took their side. And so, because how do they know Paul and Barnabas didn't forge the letter, for example? So they're sending even more witnesses back with Paul and Barnabas so that they can also bear testimony of what happened here in Jerusalem, Acts 15. So they send these men, Judas and Silas. For it seemed good unto the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater bur burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, for which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. So don't worry about all the other stuff. Circumcised, you don't need to get circumcised. Do these things, you'll do well. The Jews, if their hearts truly are for the Lord, then they will love you and they will have no real reason to object or think you're stinky, as Tim might say. Next, picking up in verse 30 through 33. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, so went back to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. So the Gentiles there were glad. And I assume that the Jews who might have been other-minded also were glad. They understood now greater what God's will was for the church, for his people. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren <coughs> with, with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. So then Judas and Silas went back to Jerusalem, essentially. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let's go again to visit our brethren in every city. So go back to where we were at before, where we have preached the word of the Lord 
and see how they do. So unfortunately, Paul and Barnabas had a split here. I'm not going to read those verses, but that was the idea. That's what Paul's attention was. Let's go back to where we were. Let's see how our brothers and all the places that we visited before are doing. And they did that. And then we pick up in Acts 16, 4. Not only did they go back and visit them and see how they're doing, but it says, as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep. So they also went back to them because Moses is preached in every city in the synagogue, and they knew the same argument, if it hadn't already started to happen, was going to happen. That there would be earnest, believing Jews who were zealous for the law, who would think, well, Gentiles got to keep it too, right? Certainly they got to keep it. So this answered that question. And Acts 21, 25, we see uh, the same thing reiterated. Paul, Many years later, Paul is back. And uh, this same thing as touching the Gentiles, which believe we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only to keep themselves from uh, things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. So this was the consistent message from Acts 15 on once this question, once it was clarified and clear to all the saints that it was open to everybody, that the Gentiles did not need to come in through the Jewish gates to become a person of God, that they could freely come to God in their own repentance and their own faith, and, re and be received of him, and receive the Holy Ghost, and be baptized, and fully receive and partake in all the benefits of being a child of God here in this earth, and live in hope of eternal life with him, without having to be circumcised, without having to keep the law of Moses. Once that had become clear, then the first question was, well, okay, how do we sort this out? And so this answered that. So in general, that is... And I have a few more slides and stuff I want to go over, but uh, that's the main. In, in general, that is the summary of this here. This is what had happened. This is the main players that took place. Just imagine what what it, what period in history that was this was like. I mean, the God at this point had finally revealed His Son. The world <laughs> knew who the Messiah was. Up until this time, most of the world didn't even care about the coming Messiah or even necessarily know about the coming Messiah. The Jews did, but they had twisted and perverted how that was going to unfold and what the significance of that would be to the rest of the world. But he came and did his work, and then he sent his apostles out to clarify how the rest of the world needs to receive him and could receive him. What a great, I mean, in, in a period of just a few decades, out of all of human history, just a few little decades sliced of, it's amazing. It's incredible. That, you know, right, yes. Pentecost. Yes. That, that's when the promise of the Father came unto the world. Yes. Right. They saw, Tim had mentioned Pentecost, so yes. But they were still, they didn't understand still all of how, what the ramifications, how that would be walked out in the world. Yes, at that, that point, they understood this is a real deal. <laughs> this is like all that stuff prophesied. But they didn't understand how it was to be walked out. It took time. It was from the beginning. And that's all, like my first opening slide again. It's simple, but we're sometimes not too smart. So we complicate stuff. So, so I want to go over and kind of look at some of the places and a little detail about what it was in ancient times, maybe a couple little things about that place, and then uh, what it is modern, if it's around today. So we'll look at just a few of them, and then we'll wrap up the sermon here. So I'm going to look at Caesarea, Damascus, Antioch in Syria, Tarsus, and Antioch in Pisidia. So we'll take a look at some of these real quick here. So first and foremost, we'll do Caesarea. So in the Gospels, we find Caesarea Philippi mentioned. This is not the Caesarea that's mentioned in Acts. Again, there were many cities named Caesarea as well. So, And in fact, um, Antioch and Pisidia was also known as Antioch Caesarea at some different times in history. So it can get very confusing. So uh, Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi actually is in Matthew and Mark, and it's the place where Jesus to, I asked them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter made his confession. You are the Son of God, and, you know. And, and Jesus says, "Well, man has some flesh and blood; it's not revealed this to you, but God, the Father." And I find it interesting that in Caesarea Philippi were many, many um, 
um, ritual sites for the god Pan. So, and Pan was later to the pantheon, so the multi-gods. So it kind of makes sense that they're in this area where there's all kinds of, where it's like all-inclusive, like any old god, Jesus brings this up. Well, who do you say I am? Similar to what Paul did in Acts 17, when he says, hey, you got all these statues to all these gods, and you got one to an unknown god, I'm going to declare him unto you. Kind of the same thing. It's like, I don't know if that's true or if that really is, but it, it just kind of, but this is not the Caesarea that we read about in Acts. The Caesarea that we read about in Acts is a Caesarea Maritima or Maritime. It's a port city. So the, the one Caesarea Philippi was the Caesarea of Philip, the Tetrarch. So that's why it's Philippi. Now, Philip's wife was taken by Herod, Herodias, and that's, John the Baptist condemned Herod for doing that. And this Caesarea actually was Herod's Caesarea. So this has a connection, although it's not called Caesarea, Caesarea Herodias, because it's, the, it's, in, it's in Herod's territory, and it's called Caesarea. Everyone would know it's Herod's Caesarea. He's the one that built it, and he's the one that made it famous. So we see here ancient Caesarea, the city of ancient Caesarea of Maritime was built by Herod the Great in about 25 to 13 BCE. So it's a relatively new city. It's not an ancient city. For us, it's ancient, but at that time, it wasn't. As a major port, it served as an administrative center in the province of Judea in the Roman Empire. During the Muslim conquest in the 7th century, it was the last city of the Holy Land to fall to the Arabs. The city degraded to a small village after the provincial capital was moved from here to Ramallah and had an Arab majority until Crusader conquest. Under the Crusaders, it became once again <clears throat> a major port in a fortified city. It was diminished after the Moluk conquest. I read about that too, but I'm not gonna get into it. That was just another set of um, infightings. Um, in 1884, Bosniak immigrants settled there, establishing a small fishing village, just Bosniak from the Bosnia Herzegovina, so the Bosnians. So that's, um, in February 1948, the Bosniak village was conquered by a Palmuk unit commanded by Yitzhak Rabin. So some of you may re recognize that name, Yitzhak Rabin. He was the fifth prime minister of Israel in the 1970s for four years. But he was a general of, uh, of this uh, Palmuk unit, which was actually, they were like kind of Israeli freedom fighters. They were, Israel wasn't a nation yet in the early 40s, so they had these groups of of fighters so he was a leader a general of one of those so it ties in with that here's uh, an artist's conception of caesarea maritima in roman times so kind of nice little city pretty cool there yeah yeah so as it said it kind of fell into disrepair and was abandoned um while it was a very modern and um useful roman port it wasn't too useful for modern shipping it wasn't deep enough and it just wasn't so it kind of fell into disrepair um so modern caesarea actually the modern day caesarea was established in 1952 near the ruins of the old city it is an affluent town in north central israel so it's not a port anymore uh, which inherits its name from and much of its territory from the ancient city of caesarea maritima with a population of around 5,400, it is the only Israeli locality managed by a private organization, the Caesarea Development Corporation, which is also known as the CDC. It's not the same CDC. In 2011, the ruins were incorporated into the newly created Caesarea National Park. Now, interestingly enough, the land here that this was owned by the Rothschilds, and they donated the land, but now they are a 50% owner of the private organization that controls this region. So the Rothschilds control this, this area through, the, through this. Yes, it's a 50-50 split between them and, the, and is Israel in 1952. So very interesting. Let's do Damascus. So Damascus is mentioned back as far as 1500 BC and maybe even earlier. So it's hard to get some of this because they say like 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 years ago, which we know is wrong. But um, Damascus seems to have been a city for a very long time. It's an ancient city that has uh, invaded and been invaded and revived many times. It was conquered by Alexander the Great in 333 BC and subsequently Hellenized. 
Modern day Damascus has about 2.5 million people and is the capital of the modern country of Syria. Islam is the dominant religion. Christians represent about 15 to 20 percent of the population. There's a small Jewish community in the Jewish quarter, but there are remnants of an ancient and large Jewish presence in Syria, which we know. And that's why Paul was on his way to Damascus, because there were a lot of Jews that lived there, dating back to at least Roman times, if not before, to the time of King David. So there could have been a Jewish settlement there for hundreds, thousands of years. Uh, one historical note of our e event of note. So in 1860, there was a civil conflict in Mount Lebanon and Damascus, which was also known as the Massacre of the Christians. So the upper left picture there is uh, the ruins of the Christian quarter of the city after hundreds of Christians were slaughtered and the buildings were destroyed. And then the lower left is uh, just an etching, a wood etching from uh, eight, uh, 1497 of what was Damascus at the time that that was so around. 600 years ago. And then on the right is a picture of modern day Damascus, which is still a very bustling modern city. And in, yes, it's huge in, in Turkey or in Syria, excuse me, the capital of Syria. So the next one, let's take a look at Antioch in Syria. So Antioch was founded near the end of the fourth century BCE by Seleucus I Nicator. One, uh, one of Alexander the Great's generals. So after Alexander the Great died, it was divided up into four. So this is one of the Seleucid area. So the city's geographical, military, and economic location benefited its occupants. Um, uh, particularly such features as, as the spice trade, the Silk Road, and the Royal Road. It eventually rivaled Alexandria as the chief city of the Near East. The city was the capital of the Seleucid Empire until 63 BC when the Romans took control, making it the seat of the governor of the province of Syria. So it was a very important place. Uh, carrying on here. Antioch was called the cradle of Christianity as a result of its longevity and the pivotal role that it played in the emergence of both Hellenistic Judaism and early Christianity. So it's one of the places where Hellenistic Judaism first began to develop and Christianity. It essentially was kind of the Christian version of Jerusalem. It really was the heart of the Christian church in the early years of Christianity. Um, it attracted uh, many of the earliest missionaries. It was evangelized by Barnabas and Paul and perhaps Peter. His converts were the first to be called Christians. We've read that. The Christian population was estimated by Christendom at about 100,000 people at the time of Theodosius I, which was around 379 to 395 AD. So there were a lot of Christians, 100,000 people at that time. That's a lot in one city. Um, in the time of Augustine, which was around the time of the new church, it's estimated it might have had up to a quarter million people. So for an ancient city of a quarter million people, that's a very large city. It's a very, I mean, they didn't have flushing toilets or any, you know, it's, that's a very large city. So, um, so over the years, it's kind of gone, it fell apart. So let's see here, I think I skipped. So over the years, though, it, it fell out of favor and it kind of just, just fell into disrepair and nobody has really taken over it since. So I found some pictures online, but they were actually kind of hard to see. So I, I found a nice etching or a print from 1837 of some of the ruins of Antioch in Syria here. So this is a wall. There's actually, and it's not in this one, there's another section in one of the valleys called the Iron Gate that's there, but there was the wall of Antioch and some of the other buildings, but for the most part, it's gone. Um, next to it, there is a city called Antak Antikaya in Turkey, which is built up but the ruins are mostly gone. This is about all that's left. So Antioch in Syria doesn't really exist as a city today. Let's take a look at Tarsus. So the ancient name is Tarsos, going back at least 3,500 years. The original name given to the city by the Hittites. So it goes way back who were among the earliest settlers of the region in the historical period. During the Hellenistic era, era it, it was known as Antiochia of the city Sidonis. So even Tarsus was another Antioch. So again, there's Antiochs everywhere. So um, during the Roman Empire, Tarsus was the capital of the... 
fled to. And there are several other engines of Tarshish. Um, it was settled by the descendants of Javan. It's also the birthplace of the Apostle Paul, as we read here in Acts 21, 39. But Paul's... Yeah, okay. But Paul, but, uh, but Paul said, I am a man which am a... In the city of no mean city, that doesn't mean people are mean. It means it's not like some little be turned town. It's it's not an average city. It's an important city. And I beseech you for me to speak unto the people. So there is something else that historically happened there in Tarsus, not biblically related, but Roman related that you may have heard of. So here is a picture of the ruins of the gate of Cleopatra in Tarsus. So in oh, there's other ruins, but this is the gate of Cleopatra. So the reason A.D. Mark Anthony summoned Cleopatra to meet him here in Tarsus, and that's the first time they ever met. Not according to William Shakespeare in his play, but according to real history. So this is where Mark Anthony and Cleopatra first met each other, and they subsequently had a child. And it was a whole, and, and Shakespeare wrote a play, and it was a whole mess. Shakespeare in his play does not mention the city of Tarsus, but this is where historically Mark Anthony and Cleopatra met. So. Um, and Tarsus is still a very large city today. Here is a picture of modern-day Tarsus, and it's part of the fourth largest metropolitan area in Turkey with a population of over 3 million people. So not just Tarsus, but that region has a population of over 3 million people. So it's a, kind of a suburban sprawl like Chicago land is. So, so one more. Let's take a look at Antioch and Pisidia. So according to tradition, the city dates back to the 3rd century BCE, founded by the Seleucid dynasty, one of the Hellenistic kingdoms. After the death of Alexander the Great, Seleucus I, Nicator, founder of Seleucid dynasty, took control of Basidia. So he also had this. This is all part of the Seleucid area. Captured places were Hellenized, and in order to protect the population, fortified cities were founded at strategical important places, usually on the Acropolis. Seleucus the first Nicor founded nearly 60 cities and gave to 16 of them the name of his father, Antichius. So again, that's another, so they were all over the place, these cities here. Um, so one interesting thing here, in 270 BC, so after it was founded, in 270 BT, BC, the Gauls or the Galatians came in and wanted to conquer this region. And there was a big battle but the Galatians lost for one reason and one reason only because of elephants. The then actually the battle was in the Tarsus Mountains, so it wasn't in Antioch, but it was for this whole region. Because the Seleucids used 16 elephants, and the Galatians had never seen an elephant before, so they freaked out. They didn't know what it was. So so um, <laughs> it's uh, here. So so historian Lucian reported the comment of Antiochus. It is a great shame that we owe our liberation to 16 elephants. <laughs> so an interesting little fact there that kind of so, and harkens me back to the Lord of the Rings movie with the elephants, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, so, yep. So they never seen elephants. So because of the 16 elephants, and imagine, I mean, if you're, if you're a foot soldier back in, you know, in ancient days, it's not modern battle, and you're on the ground and you see these huge animals with, yeah, so I kind of freak out too, you know, but I never heard of or even knew any such thing existed. So interesting little tidbit of history. Um, so modern day Antioch and Pisidia also does not exist either. It's a ruins. So there is a, um, it's a site of many archaeological digs or tours that you navigate the site. Uh, the site lies approximately one kilometer northeast of Yalvik in Turkey, a city. So you can see kind of a little bit here down this is a, a more modern city but this is actually just from google maps i snipped this from google maps um terrain view so that's what it looks like here's another picture of some of it so it's just a ruins there's really not much but just think i mean that's not a so that's not a huge area that was a big you can see kind of where the walls were at and stuff and everything just to get, get an idea even if you harken back to the picture that we had of caesarea maritima it's not like huge you know we think of cities even like woodstock is twenty thousand people it's geographically much larger than those cities would be so and almost all of them of course were walled cities so just just to get a sense of scale here um 
So the distances here, just again, so like from Jerusalem to Damascus, as the crow flies, it'd be about 175 miles. From Damascus to Tarsus, it'd be around 360 miles. And from Tarsus to Antioch and Pisidia, it'd be around 280 miles. So just get an idea of scale there. So, and then a couple quick verses in closing. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 11. And remember these, I enjoy this stuff. I, I, I enjoy this. So again, as I say these things, it's a warning to myself not to get too carried away in all the gnosis and digging into all these little things that are there. First Corinthians three eleven, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then Titus three verses three through seven. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of our God and Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, or by knowledge that we have, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Just keep it simple, brothers and sisters. All the stuff, I love this. I think it adds some flavor to scripture, but it's not the meat of it. What really matters is how do I take his spirit-inspired word and live in his image and glorify his name? on a daily basis and he's given us all that we need to be able to do that through his word and by his spirit so thanks brothers and sisters godspeed have a great rest of the sabbath